Hey everyone, welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander and Susanna Lowy is joining me on the show today. Susanna hails from Philadelphia where she freelances as a flute player and serves as a teaching artist, which is a term we dive into on the show. You may or may not have heard of Project 440, a program that focuses on social entrepreneurship for young musicians. Susanna is both program director and lead teaching artist at Project 440. Susanna shares all of her career shoulds, which you will no doubt relate to, and how she dismantled them. For those of you who are interested in creating a chamber music series one day, Susanna shares the defining moment that caused her to create her own, which led her to some really fantastic and unexpected career opportunities. Before we begin, a couple of quick things. Please join the conversation at facebook.com slash crushing classical, as well as crushing classical on Instagram. If you love our content, it would mean the world to us for you to comment and share it with your classical musician friends and colleagues. I'd like to thank Fix Music for being a sponsor of Crushing Classical Podcast. Fixmusic.com is your online resource for affordable, high-quality sheet music. Fix also offers unique buying options for individuals, teachers, and schools. Whether you have a huge private teaching studio or you run a music program, Fix has a solution for you. Contact them through their website for more information. Fix offers priority and priority express shipping at super affordable rates, meaning they do not pad their shipping rates to make more money. If you need sheet music fast, Fix will expedite it to you as inexpensively as possible. Also, remember to use the discount code CRUSH and get 10% off your order. Let's get started. Hi, Susanna. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fine. So thanks for coming on today. So Susanna, you're a flute player and you're based in Philadelphia. And I wanted to talk to you all about um, the work that you do with the company or the um, program called Project 440. Will you tell me about what Project 440 is? Sure. Um, So the brief overview mission statement of Project 440 is that uh, it engages, educates, and inspires young musicians, um, and that provides them with both career and life skills. Um, And the ideal is to to, uh, develop uh, young musicians into uh, tomorrow's civic-minded and entrepreneurial leaders. So Project 440 is not an artistic organization. Um, We don't provide lessons. It's not orchestra or even chamber music per se, but instead we're taking those um, students within orchestras and within chamber music programs and we're coaching them on community engagement and leadership and entrepreneurship, um, interactive performance, and then we also have um, workshops about college and career readiness. Oh, that's so awesome. So people that are already in youth orchestras and chamber programs around Philadelphia, they can do this in in addition to that to to kind of broaden their skill set. Exactly. And um, so initially, uh, for the past few years, we've been working within uh, the Philadelphia School District's All City Orchestra. So just as it sounds, All City is the highest performing um, orchestra within um, the school district of Philadelphia. Um, All City used to have weekly rehearsals and a full-time chamber music program. And actually, I love the statistic. Uh, 15% of the Philadelphia Orchestra went through the All City Orchestra. Oh, wow. Um, which is just incredible. Um, yeah. But then uh, over you know the past 20 years, the budget has been cut down to um, where it was five or six rehearsals and then one concert. Um, so <clears throat> when uh, the uh, founder of Project 440, the executive director, Joe Conyers, he became the um, conductor of the All City Orchestra. He said, I would love to do this. I'm happy to conduct the All City Orchestra. However, I want all of the students to have access to Project 440 programming. Um, so we brought all of our workshops and seminars and coachings to all the students within All City. Um, and so what we're doing for next year is we're expanding past All City to any music student within the school district of Philadelphia. So we're going to have kind of a standalone program that students can sign up for that will be incentivized. So students will be earning money for um, coming to our programming. Um, That's part of a something called Work Ready in Philadelphia, where uh, you know, a lot of time what prohibits students uh, from taking part in educational after school activities is that they feel that they need to have a job instead. So mm. is providing students with 
you know, enough funding so that they one day a week, they don't have to have that job. Um, so we're, you know, that that pro that program is in the works and we're hoping to get it kickstarted in November. So it's going to be open to um, any of the school, the music students within the school district of Philadelphia. Um, because we realized that while providing uh, programming for the all city kids is important and it's not like these kids have a lot, they still have the most in the school district. Mm. So we want to be able to provide the programming for the students who need it even more in addition to the all city students. I love how collaborative it is, you know, like you're just, you're able to integrate with all these, you know, with the all city as well as the public school system so that everyone can have access to it. It's really cool. Yeah. See, I mean, you know, working uh, arts organizations, uh, have a history of not perhaps working all that well together, but, um, uh -huh more and more funding being provided for organizations that are working well together. Um, it, uh, the Mellon Foundation just provided Philadelphia with this $2.4 million grant um, that you know, the stipulation is that all of the arts organizations work together. Uh, so kind of creating um, an environment and ecosystem within the arts in a city so that people aren't acting as standalone organizations. That's awesome. So how did you initially get involved in Project 440? Well, um, I was a teaching artist for the Philadelphia Orchestra, and I, I still do that. Uh, what does a, that mean? Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but what does that mean? Well, so the definition of a, a teaching artist, you know, changes according to who you're talking to. <laughs> but the idea is to... Um, negate that thought of those who can't do teach and instead um, that to bring artists into the classroom that are of course also trained in teaching but are bringing their high level of artistry to an educational setting um, mm. and and I, I shouldn't have said classroom it doesn't necessarily have to be a classroom it, um, in any situation in which you're engaging uh, your your audience um, in what you do in order for them to feel a personal connection with the art. Um, and it oftentimes has to do with um, breaking down the fourth wall boundary. Um, but for the Philadelphia Orchestra in particular, uh, there's a school partnership program where we have a handful of schools where we go into the elementary school classrooms um, each week, one day a week, and uh, work with them on delving into the music. So while we have, you know, some instruments like percussion instruments and recorders and um, handbells and stuff like that at our disposal, the idea is not necessarily proficiency at any of those instruments, but instead to use those instruments as a tool to delve into whatever the teaching artist decides to teach. So anything from you know, Beethoven to understanding tonic and dominant, um, to, uh, the form of a piece. Uh, and so helping students to, um, understand something that they didn't previously understand through music. That sounds great. And so you did that through the, the Philadelphia orchestra has a program that you started yeah. working for. And then, right. and then, um, and then your, uh, the bass player who started 440, um, Mr. Conyers, right? What's his first mm -hmm. name? Joseph. Um, yeah. Joseph, right. Um, then he started 440, correct? And then asked you to, yeah. to continue? Yeah. So, um, you know, Philadelphia, even though it is a big city, when you start getting into kind of uh, niche careers, there aren't that, that many people. So when he was asking around about who could, you know, be a teaching artist for his organization, I was one of the names that was listed. And um, so he, he hired me to come up to Saratoga and teach for him at the New York State Summer School of the Arts. And then from there, we just kind of hit it off. And I was hired a little bit more the next fall. And then before long, <laughs> I was the lead teaching artist and also um, uh, have the position of um, program manager now. So Great. So you get to decide what they play, what, what the groups play and things like that. Yeah. Although, um, 
uh, the, it's more of developing the programming in terms of um, what the kids are going to learn in terms of um, uh, community engagement. And so um, how to develop programs that uh, that will be interactive for their audiences. So it's not, I mean, well, if I, if it's necessary, I'll, I'll figure out repertoire for the students to play. It, it, mm, ideally, actually, they come in with music that they've worked on and uh, that already know, and then we develop an interactive program from there, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So um, when we initially, when we first started talking, Susanna, we were talking about role models in classical music. And I know that you've gotten, um, you have a point of view about this through what, you know, your work is with 440. And I just wanted to talk to you about that because, um, you know, currently, mostly the role models for young musicians are professional musicians in top five orchestras. Um, and you mentioned that you think that's a problem. Yeah. And um, I just want to kind of give a disclaimer that I don't think that, you know, classical musicians in top five orchestras shouldn't be role models, but just right. that do yeah, exactly. uh, other role models as well. Um, because we need to be able to reflect um, versions of role models that uh, are indicative of all the different types of careers that um, right, should exactly. be successes. Um, and um, what we want to avoid is, you know, these other types of careers as being considered um, lesser than or fallback careers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if we can have this idea of a portfolio career or even some completely all different path um, still having to do with music as being something that is aspired to, um, then we can avoid the whole trauma of um feeling like you're a failure just because you're not in a top five orchestra. Um, and, and it also leads to musicians that are much happier because they're creating careers that fit who they truly are. Um, not just a portion of themselves, but something that actually reflects their whole person. Yeah. Um, so um, I think it's uh, kind of similar to the the pipeline issue that um, is being brought up a lot in terms of getting more diversity uh a demographical um, diversity in uh, on the stage, you know, that obviously stems from not having enough diversity in the conservatories and before that in high school programs and middle school programs and so on. So it's a pipeline that um, has to be addressed from the very beginning. I think that you can apply the same concepts to the idea of role models. You know, you can't expect um, students to be branching out and be creative in their career structure if their role models are only fitting within one box. Right. So you're saying the concept of of the um, creating more diversity as far as, you know, races, like diff all the all the different people that can be involved mm -hmm. in classical music besides, um, you know, mm -hmm. what it typically historically was, but also that um, you believe that you can apply that concept to just the diversity of who the, the role models are. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, exactly. And I can totally relate to that because I grew up with my role models were people in top five orchestras. Not that there's anything wrong with that. They're great people. And mm -hmm. it made me aspire to have that kind of job, which I didn't achieve, you know? And so for the longest time, I felt like that. Like I was, I wasn't a real musician or I hadn't, I was, wasn't successful and um there there really were no other role models to look at as far as i could see right you know? no, absolutely the same way and so to some extent i think we're kind of paving the way which is great but um you know there's also a uh, a lot of inner struggle and turmoil that goes along with that and i think if with the next generations if we can alleviate or completely avoid that, uh, we'll have students that are able to be much more free in their thinking. Um, and not only that, but um, they should be provided the tools that they need to get to that point so that they're not constantly having to reinvent the wheel for themselves or feel like they're reinventing the wheel. Right. So, um, you know, this kind of leads to the whole idea of what we think is the example of success as a musician, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
what kinds of things do you do in 440 to help students define their idea of success? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's interesting to ask that because one of the uh, activities, brainstorming activities that I do in one of the first seminars uh, when I'm kind of introducing the concepts behind Project 440 is we do, you know, shows of hands um, of what is success? And so I start with very black and white questions. Um, is, to you, is success being famous? Is it having a lot of money? Um, is it being in an orchestra? Is it happiness? And very quickly, you know, they realize that these are all kind of ridiculous questions because, I mean, <laughs> anybody knows that it's not going to be just a um, one dimensional, uh, you're not going to feel successful because of one particular thing. But it leads um, along the path of thinking of, okay, so if it is a combination of these things, what do, what do I need to feel successful to feel happy? Um, and so start the brainstorming with just shows of hands and then move on to, you know, sharing thoughts. Um, and then from there, uh, continuing the thought process alone so that, um, they can start to write their own artist statements that uh, can lead them on the path to figuring out what they want to do with their passions for the world. Uh, because one of the things that we feel really strongly about in Project 440 is that um, people need to become artist citizens to be providing something for the world uh, with their artistry or with whatever they're passionate about. Um, I was, I, I had the, Amazing opportunity to meet Leslie Odom Jr. from um, Hamilton of, uh, about a month ago. And um, he was actually in Philadelphia to talk to, he because he went through the Philadelphia school system. Um, he went to Kappa, which is the Creative and Performing Arts High School in Philly. And when he was 17, so I would imagine probably a senior in high school, um, he, on a whim, decided to audition for Rent when they came through Philly with uh, um, with their audition tour. and got a role. And so he's been on Broadway since. And then his most recent was, of course, Hamilton. And one of the things that he was talking to this, the Project 440 students about was that love is a verb, um, or it can be a verb, it should be a verb. Love is something you do. So figure out what it is that you love. And then do that. And not because you, you know, the whole that little trite statement of, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Not because of that, but because if, if you are doing what you love, then you'll be providing the most you possibly can for the world. Um, so that it, it was great to, I think for the students to hear that from someone who wasn't me or who wasn't Joe, you know, yeah. from who was, you know, so successful on um, a different level. So. so that, that sounds awesome that they, that they were exposed to him and, um, I'm just wondering how has working with Project 440 helped your point of view about music because, uh, and, and having a life and a career in music, because I can tell you from my own experience, I never considered what the, what work that I would do, how that would help, you know, the world <laughs> when I was coming up through, um, I feel differently about that now, but when I was in my twenties and thirties, even, you know, I was so just kind of had the blinders on, like, you know, awesome. I got to get a job in an orchestra and, and it was so mult, not, not, it was not, you know, diverse, <laughs> like oh, what you were saying, you know? So I wanted right. to know how that, um, you know, how that, how working with them has helped you or changed the way that your point of view is about it. Absolutely. I mean, I, uh, I think I, I first started to branch out of kind of, cause I was the exact same way. I mean, and you know, to some extent, some days I still am, you know, it's, yeah. I, I think it's so part of the core of who I am. Not that I, I mean, I, I occasionally, you know, I'll, um, think about taking auditions and I took an audition last year. So it's not like, again, it's not something that needs to be black and white. Like I'm never going to do this again. Um, but that there is so much more out there also. And I think it started with the uh, teaching artist work in the Philly Orchestra, just how fulfilled I felt and um, how much of a difference you can see you're making. Um, and I don't think that sort of difference is impossible to have on a stage. I mean, I think that 
playing music as part of a huge team and um, providing that for an audience is hugely beneficial, obviously. Um, but uh, it, it was just, I felt like a, a different part of myself was um, being satiated in a really wonderful way. Um, and then so when I started working with Project 440 and kind of was able to define what I was doing and then um, push those ideals onto the younger generation. So not only um, exemplify them, but say, hey, this is exactly what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. We want you to um, think from this point, um, from a very young age. Um, I and mean, we've even done some work with middle school students. So, oh, wow. Um, you know, at a very young age, we want you to be thinking outside of these boxes that have been set before you. Um, what else can you do? What else do you want to do? Um, and, you know, when when I'm teaching it, I 1000% if that percentage is possible, which is not 100% um, believe it. Um and, but, but again, like I said before, there's, you know, just grew up with such a different feeling through my, through my 20, from my teens, through my twenties and I'm, you know, 35 now. So it's, um, it's something that's deep rooted and, mm -hmm. uh, and and definitely like when I'm by myself, some or I find myself when I'm like talking about my career, I'll put like career in quotes. And just like after a conversation like that, I'm like, why did I do that? Like, why do I kind of discount what I'm doing? Because I'm actually really, really proud of what I'm doing. I um, but it is just this thing that's really deep inside of feeling like, oh, I'm not in the Philadelphia Orchestra, therefore I'm not a real musician. And that's what I want the next generations to never experience because it's just not true, you know? Yes. Oh my God, I can so relate to that. <laughs> I really do relate to that, you know? And it's, there's something about, as a musician, you don't want to own your successes because you're always looking for the next success or or to get better. You know, right. you never come out of your lesson and go, I nailed it. I'm done. Like you're always, you know, starting from an early age, you're like, I need to get better. And it's and not there yet. One, right. And that's one of the beautiful things about music and about the arts in general is that it's limitless. And um, that's, you know, I think the original reason that I fell in love with music is that I felt like it was the thing that I could dive into that I could just keep going forever. And I was never going to reach any sort of, um, uh, bottom. Of course, you know, as you grow up, you realize that <laughs> everything is limitless, you know, like even a simple math equation is in fact limitless, but it just didn't feel that way when I was in middle school. And so that's kind of, that's why I, um, you know, uh, went to where I was inclined to study music, but, um, yeah. So it's, the, it's that, uh, when, when you apply that to success it can, it, or happiness, it can be a problem, you know, like I'm not going to be happy or I'm not going to be successful until this one particular thing happens. And then once that thing happens, like what you reach a finish line, that doesn't really happen. You know, yeah, I know. I know. So, so was there any point that you realized that the skill you had other skills besides playing? I know, um, like what you're talking about right now is the, the feeling of limitless, um, possibilities but was there was there a per certain point that you realized oh i have these other skills that i'm actually really good at that can actually you know complement my performing career yeah um it's kind of fun. when when i was uh in in college i think i was either a senior in in college or first year of my masters i was in cleveland for both so i kind of get confused over <laughs> the timeline sometimes but i started uh doing triathlons Mm. And I th thought I had discovered this whole new side of myself. Like, oh, look, I can be athletic. The little like bookworm musician nerd can be athletic. And, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I felt like I was a whole new person. And then I remember I was sitting on the bike trainer one cold Cleveland winter night in front of, you know, watching probably a Sex in the City episode. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> Like, you know, and pedaling my legs, you know, over and over again, and then like doing a speed drill and then backing off and then doing another 30 seconds of hard. And then all of a sudden my legs just stopped. And I was like, it's the same damn thing. Like it, you know, music and triathlon, it's just a different medium, same thing. And at first I was like, 
disgusted with myself, you know, um, because, you know, it's just like, okay, you have a routine, you do what you need to do to get to a concert, to get to an audition, a recital or a race or whatever it is, but right. um, you follow a schedule and it really like that type of a mentality that works for a classical musician absolutely is the exact same thing as an athletic personality. And, um, so at first I was kind of horrified and then I just thought, well, you know what, if this is how I work, number one, at least I know myself. And number two, I can apply that to so many other types of things. So from starting like launching your own programs to, um, to athletics, to music, whatever it is, you know, that same sort, uh, I know how, like that I'm good at lists and good at spreadsheets, you know, and then, and I'm also good at following through with those things. So sometimes it means learning new skills in order to apply that to a different medium. Uh, like for example, I did a lot of work with Habitat for Humanity one summer, and that is again, the same sort of thing, like measure something and then you know, very exactly. And then cut it and then put it in the wall. And it, it just, it felt like it was the same sort of thought process that was um, going on in my head. So, um, you know, so it doesn't mean that you're not developing new skills, but it just means that you kind of understand how you work. I don't know if I really answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought it was very insightful because it seems like, it seems like you had a little bit of a, you know, like a revelation about it, you know, like how it was, how preparing for a triathlon was so much the same as preparing for something musical. Yeah. It really and, is. Um, and one of the things that I've recently been able to articulate is that um, it's really about ownership and pride in what you're doing, whatever it is. Um, yeah. And I think that's why jobs can become frustrating, even if they're this amazing or orchestral job, if you, or, you know, a teaching at, at a college, whatever it is, if you don't feel like you have ownership over what you're doing, or if I feel like I don't have ownership over what I'm doing, I no longer want to do it. Um, and I'm not saying, oh, I have to be the boss. It's not that at all. It's that you need to, or I need to feel that um, I'm able to explore and do things um, in a way that is, is who I am. I, I'm not really articulating this very well, but um, I guess maybe no. I need to think through it. <laughs> I, I know. I think it totally makes sense. I, I totally get what you're saying. And because, you know, you have to have ownership. That's part of that's part of the not not putting career in quotes. And yeah, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fall back on that, like ingrained mm -hmm. identity problem that we have, you know, <laughs> but I love I love the idea of working towards and it's my goal, too that the next generations of musicians won't define themselves by this black and white, like either I get this job or I'm not a musician because it's such, such bullshit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so on this show, I always ask my guests about their defining moment where they were at a career crossroads or a life crossroads where they chose to switch gears in their career. And I call it a fuck this moment mm -hmm. in your adult life or outside of, you know, in your life or your mm -hmm. career where, where you chose the unknown route. So, um, what was your defining moment in your career? Um, well, maybe a, a year or two after I moved to Philadelphia. So I, I finished my doctorate at the worst time in all of modern history to finish to come out of school. So I finished in the spring of 2009. Um, <laughs> and um, I, uh, you know, got the part time job with the Philly Orchestra Outreach, the teaching artist work. Um, but, you know, I was earning one hundred sixty five dollars a week and that's it. And so yeah. I moved to Philly and for that. And also I have family there and I had lived in Philly my senior year of high school to um, take lessons with the principal flute player. So I felt like I had some ties to Philly and I've always loved the city. Um, but. I, uh, you know, was really starting from almost nothing. And so, you know, I did all the things that you're supposed to do with playing for everybody and, and it worked. I, you know, I was getting calls, um, but I was constantly waiting for the phone to ring or checking my email over and over again. Um, you know, I remember the first time I got called for the ballet, I'm like jumping up and down, you know, <laughs> and it is, it's a nice, nice feeling. Um, 
by the way, I still jump up and down the, the time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I hear you. It's like, you don't want to be that person waiting on the, waiting right. for the call. But what, then when you get it, you're like, ah, my life. Yes. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I actually came back from a date that was horrible. And, but I hope that I would have had the slot process, even if the date had been awesome. But so I got back from the date and I remember like sitting at my little counter in my 500 square foot hobbit hole and, <laughs> um, <laughs> and just feeling like, ugh. and then I thought, you know, I would, I really tend to not just sit around and wait for guys or girls or whatever to call. Like, I'm not going to just wait for someone else to call me. I'm going to, you know, either move on or do what I need to do. So why am I sitting around and waiting for my career and to call? So I, that, that like same minute, I like grabbed a pencil and paper and just started writing down all the different people that I would love to play with, um, you know, friends. So I'm not talking about, Oh, I want to play with, you know, the principal flute or the, the concert master, the Berlin Philharmonic. So I wasn't being ridiculous. I was just thinking I have all these friends, these amazing friends who are musicians and so why aren't we doing things together? Mm -hmm. So um, my family also has uh, this really special property in Vermont um, that I grew up going there every summer. And it was always kind of this place that felt perfect every summer, you know? And right. so I thought, I want to do a chamber music festival. I want to be more part of this community in Vermont because we were definitely vacationers. And I always felt like I wanted to be more part of the actual community there. Um, and so I was, I just thought, you know, bringing, bringing part of myself there, bringing music to this, um, town, uh, on Stratton mountain, um, would be a way that I could be more part of that. And it could be, and I, and I'd be playing music. Um, and so at first I just started writing down all the people that I wanted to hang out with and musicians that I wanted to play with, you know, cause it's, it's a combination of both, both the personality and the playing. Yeah. Um, and then I uh, started doing research about uh, how much it would cost to house people for a week, which is really surprisingly cheap. And then, and also how much I wanted to pay each of the musicians for the week. And then how much does the town hall uh, cost to rent? Is the town hall equipped to do like a performance? And it was, thankfully, it's the cutest little town hall in the entire world. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, and just created a very rudimentary budget, you know, advertising, printing, but, you know, it's actually really simple. It's, you know, pay the musician, okay. pay, pay for the hall, pay for the house. And, um, so did you, know, you, so did you um, yeah, you like, you're realizing like, I need money for this. Right. And did you start without money and worry about that later? How did you, how did you, did you have money already set aside or? Or did you raise money? Like how, I'm glad that, I mean, I love the part about making the budget, but then what was the next step about, um, about coming up with the money? Right. Um, yeah, I had zero dollars and I actually, you know, I invite, I said, I'm creating this chamber music festival. And so I invited musicians and created the programs before I had any dollars. Oh. Um, and so it was, maybe naive, maybe I was just really lucky, but I just kind of felt, okay, if I plan this, I'm going to have to raise the money because I don't have the money to pay them in my, you know, poor <laughs> bank account without any commas, you know, like, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so then I made a website and again, it's like a website that's like introducing the Pikes Falls Chamber Music Festival, you know? And so it's like a website about something that hasn't happened yet. Um, but you just pretend it's there and you build it as though it's there. And once I had it looking good online, I sent uh, an email introducing it to anybody and everybody I thought that, you know, that I thought might, might be interested. And, um, people donated right away. Like within 24 hours, I had a few thousand dollars and, you know, which is only a, a percentage of what it costs to run, but, um, or a small percentage of what it costs to run, but it was enough to kind of make me think, all right, this is going to happen. And, um, I just, you know, kept fundraising, do some fundraising concerts, uh, planned fundraisers at, you know, bars and stuff. But I find that the best way is just to cultivate relationships with donors. Um, yeah. 
I've gotten a New Music USA grant, but not until year three or four. Year four was when I got the US, uh, New Music USA grant. Um, so, you know, you kind of just have to start out and just just do it yourself because a lot of times grants you're not eligible for until, you know, it's been something's existed for two or three years. Um, mm-hmm. So and also <laughs> grants are very time consuming and there's absolutely no uh security that you're you're going to get anything um not i mean their grants are wonderful but sometimes i just feel like you know it would be better just to get to know someone that might really uh, you know want to contribute um i did a kickstarter one i think the either the second or third year I did a $10,000 kickstarter um and this year I did a fundraise, you know, Facebook has these fundraisers that, you know, it's basically like a Kickstarter, but there's no, no real, they, they don't have the uh, stipulation that you have to raise the money, all, all the entirety of the money or you don't get it. Um, so oh, I didn't know Kickstarter did that. Yeah. Um, so Kickstarters, the, you know, I think one of the reasons that it kind of raises excitement is it's, you know, time is running out. If we don't get all of the money, we don't get any of it, you know? Oh. Um, so, uh, um, there are other platforms, of course, that, that, uh, that don't do that. But, uh, I think that's one of the reasons that Kickstarter was so successful, especially at first. Uh, but, um, yeah, you know, I've just, you know, explored different ways of raising the money. I do keep all the programming at the festival free. Uh, I, I want anybody to, I mean, I, I say, obviously donations are appreciated, um, but I don't, I don't want to have a $10 a head, uh, cost because I just want people to feel like, they can come no matter what. Um, yeah, you know, I, I noticed one time when I put on, and, and I don't have any, much more scientific, um, you know, uh, data to back this up, but I did a concert, like the same chamber music concert in two different towns. And one of them we charged, I think, $10. And mm-hmm. the other one, we made it completely donation. And the donation one, we got more money because, I don't know, yeah. maybe maybe without that limit of, you know, this cost $10 to get in people yeah. are more generous. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting. Mm-hmm. So you, so you continue to raise money and, um, and then you, now do you have, um, the set same people that come and play every year or how, how does it, um, work? How many seasons have you had all of that? So this is our sixth season. So again, it starts in just a couple of weeks. It's the last week of July and first week of August. Um, and, after that first year, uh, well, it was kind of interesting what happened. Um, at the last minute, I had uh, a clarinet player who withdrew. He um, got asked to play at uh, mostly Mozart, or Mozart, I think, or something like that. And, you know, so it's understandable that uh, he couldn't come to Pikes Falls. Um, so I'm freaking out, you know, like, what am I going to do? All of a sudden, I don't have the musicians for this festival that I've yeah. just, like, a lot of money for. Um, and so one of my one of the composers in residence said, Hey, Susanna, I think, um, you'd really get along with this clarinet player down in the DC area. Um, why don't you invite him? And I was like, well, I want this to be my friends. I don't know. Inviting somebody that I don't know the first year, it could be really bad. And then I was like, you know what? I think you just have to invite him. And, um, so, uh, so I invited him up at the end of the summer. His name is Evan. And the end of the summer, summer, he said, Susanna, uh, I want you to be my flutist. And I was like, Evan, I want to be your flutist. And so it turns out he runs um, uh, a, a chamber orchestra in the DC area that has a new music leaning. Um, you know, they, the many uh, composers uh, write premieres for in, it's a orchestra called the Inscape Chamber Orchestra. Um, and, uh, you know, he was like, there's one problem. And I was like, what? And I thought, you know, maybe I had to send a recording to the conductor and it was going to be hell and all this stuff. (laughs) And he was like, I'm worried about your car because, you know, I'm in Philly and he's in DC and I was driving a 1999 Saturn. And um, he's like, I don't like you in that car. And so I was like, all right, maybe it's time that I have a different car anyhow. Um, So (laughs) I got a new car for myself, not for Evan, but, um, (laughs) And so, you know, we, we do it, uh, I'd say on average, um, one program a month. Although, you know, for the month of May and half of June, I was in DC basically the whole time. Um, we had three different operas that we were doing plus a chamber music concert. So, you know, it's really turned it and we've done four recordings and the first recording we were nominated for a Grammy. So I think like it just, 
yeah, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. I feel like it's, you know, my little scheme of starting this chamber music festival. So I wouldn't have to wait for the phone to ring. It's like, it worked, you know, <laughs> that is so great. Cause you, you collaborated and you, you branched out and, and met some new people. And then you ended up working with their thing. I just love the whole concept of collaboration and working together because, you know, in that, in that old school, black and white, you know, way of looking at classical music careers that we were talking about. It's just very competitive because you, it's just, what are you doing? Are you doing something better than me? I don't know. I better start working harder. So, you know, like you, there's not, there's not the, Hey, what are you doing? Let's do that together. Let's do something else that's different together. Like that doesn't, it's not a generalized, you know, I think feeling. Right. You know, Um, and now the Inkscape orchestras you know primarily the people that come up to my music festival so you know it's worked kind of hand in hand which is nice that's nice Uh, yeah no it's been it's been great uh so I also do like a a visual art thing at at the festival or a visual art component um and so we have you know uh from sculptures to installations to video to um you know the, the visual artists kind of create different experiences for the concert goers um that go along with the music so um trying to create you know interdisciplinary work not every single performance needs to be 100 percent interdisciplinary but just trying to breathe new life into the arts um yeah yeah i just think that's such the answer you know i had a conversation with somebody yesterday about the same thing like why aren't we combining these things so mm-hmm. that it's more of an experience for people. That's what people want now. I mean, and that's why, you know, opera was originally the, or it kind of still is like the ultimate art form. And it's why people love musicals. You have got the acting mm-hmm. and, the, and the dancing and the singing. And so just putting it all together. And again, it's not that everything needs to be part of everything that we're doing, but that just that, you know, we need to create things together. Um, and, and I mean, it, at the very bottom line, it increases your audiences because some people are going for the visual art and some people are going for the music and then hopefully they influence each other. Yeah. And then you brought in your audience and it, you know, who knows what it can lead to. That's what I love about this story is that one thing led to another and led to another. So you did all this planning before you had any money and now, now you're supported fully and you can pay your musicians. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, from, uh, you know, I, I had this idea that musicians needed to be paid at least a thousand dollars a week. So that was the initial, um, kind of, uh, line that I was in the, for, in terms of payroll. Um, but I guess I kind of thought about it. Like, I mean, this is going to sound super corny and maybe almost like make you gag, but I kind of felt <laughs> like it was like a classical music field of dreams type thing that like, you know, no, it's I, not because I was thinking that and I almost said it, if you build it, they will come like, right, but I exactly. did, I thought. Like, and you make it happen you know it's gonna it's gonna have to you know it's gonna work it has to right you know so yeah yeah so tell me you know I'm, I'm sure some of our listeners are listening and they're you know they're getting really inspired by your story and maybe some of them are inspired by the you know your involvement in the in the move you know just essentially a movement to alter classical music's future and so mm-hmm. if they if they don't know a guy like joseph conyers how does someone get involved in an organization like project 440 to get a job you know what would be your recommendation for that well so i mean first i suppose there has to be a certain amount of research done to find the organization because if you aren't aware of it of course you don't even know that you want the job right right yeah um, but um after that contact the organization. Um, one of my like role models in the Philly area, her name is Mary Javian. She, every job, and, and, and she's now, um, you know, in charge of collaborative learning at Curtis. Um, but every job that she's ever had has been something that didn't exist before. Um, That's so cool. I know it's amazing. Um, so, you know, the best thing you can do is just send your resume and say what you're interested in doing and how you want to help say you'd love to set up a time to talk on the phone um, or meet in person. Um, And, you know, every person that has approached Project 440 with that sort of um, energy has gotten our attention, Um, you know, and obviously there's protocol in terms of who's going to get hired. But if you're sincere in in, in what you want and, and you're 
qualified and you work to or if you're not qualified and you say, hey, I don't have experience in this yet, but I'd love to learn. Can I be your intern for a little while or whatever? Um, you will get a job. The, organi the organizers are going to be impressed for sure. Um, yeah. So I, I love would just that. Just contact the organization. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, so fi a couple of final questions. What is one habit or behavior that you've developed that has made the most difference in your career so far? Um, for me, this is a, a super easy one. It's just gumption, um, not being afraid to start something and to just do it yourself. Um, not only because then you get to do the things, but because people in general love to be around that type of energy and they're going to support you. They mm. want to be taken along for the ride. They want, they want to be part of what you're doing. I love that. Um, who in the classical world is inspiring you right now? Um, well, so I have a, a very typical answer for this one, but it's because <laughs> this person like really embodies absolutely everything that I want to be. And so it's Yo-Yo Ma. I mean, I just, I think that he epitomizes this idea of the 21st century classical musician and artist and social entrepreneur. Um, you know, and I think his words are artist citizen. Um, and to that end, there's this, um, the Nancy B. Hanks lecture, I think it's from 2013. Um, it's on the arts and public policy, which is really a dry title, but, um, it's called the, the title, the, of his specific speech is called Art for Life's Sake. And it's just mind blowing. Um, I show it to students all the time. So I end up watching it, you know, multiple times a year. And every time I watch it, even though I can basically quote it by now, I just feel like my mind is new. I mean, sorry, my life is newly changed. And it's just, it's really incredible. It's an hour, but I, it's, it's worth every second. And I definitely encourage anyone to watch it. Okay. Is there, is that a link? Is there, it's online? You can watch yeah, it online. It's online. Okay. All you have to do is Google Yo-Yo Ma and Art for Life's Sake or Yo-Yo Ma and Nancy B. Hanks. Or, and, and actually, he talks a lot about something called the edge effect. So you can even Google edge effect and Yo-Yo Ma and it'll come up. Um, okay. So. And I'll, you know what I'll do is find that link and I'll put it in the show notes so people can, can oh, watch awesome. it straight from there. Yeah. I'm going to watch it. It sounds great. Um, so what is your next big goal in your career? Um, I mean, I feel like I'm doing a lot of what I want to be doing and what I get scared of is that I'm stagnating or pausing and, um, not, I, I don't want to stay in, in the same place. So I want to continue doing all the things I'm doing, but I want to do them at a higher level, um, and with more thought and, um, you know, I'm not above saying I want, would love to do it with more influence, you know, like I want, um, to be taken seriously because of the thoughts that I have about classical music and because of my playing and because of my teaching, you know? So I, I just, I don't want things to stay at the same level. I just want to um, keep do, doing what I'm doing, but better. <laughs> yeah. I love that too. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel about it. Um, is there anything else that, and or anything that you'd like to promote on this interview? Um, so I have this tattoo on my wrist um, that says uh, play with love and um, you know, people notice it. I mean, it, it's just, you know, in small script on my wrist. So it's not like it's some big offensive tattoo, but it is noticed relatively often. And so the story is that I was uh, playing Hindemith symphonic metamorphosis um, in Cleveland. Uh, so this was, uh, this I remember specifically, it was my senior year of uh, undergrad. And um, so I was going to be playing it in Severance Hall, which is, you know, the big performing arts center in in Cleveland. And Hindemith, Hindemith Symphonic Metamorphosis has this huge flute solo and um, basically a whole movement long, right? And um, it was going to be on the radio. And, you know, thinking back, it's really not that big of a deal, but it certainly felt, I was freaking out. It felt like a huge deal. And so my teacher, Josh Smith, the... Um, principal flute of the Cleveland Orchestra, he took me outside of the hall and he just put his shoulder, my, his hands on my shoulders and he said, listen, don't worry about it. Just play with love. And I've really tried to take that to everything that I do. Um, you know, so whatever I'm trying to do to do it with love. And I, and I guess that kind of circles back to, I mean, that, I think that's why I really appreciated what 
Leslie Odom Jr. said, um, because I was like, oh, somebody else feels that way too, you know, um, that that just if you're doing something because you really love it, um, that, you know, it, it's going to be okay and you're going to do a good job, which is also important. <laughs> I love the idea of reminding ourselves that love is a verb, like he said. Right. Absolutely. That's really cool. I love that story. <laughs> Such a great story when when a teacher says something so impactful to you that it stays with you f enough to put it on a tattoo. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Oh, he said something to me um, last year. So I, you know, worked harder than I've ever worked for for an audition, and then you know, freaked out and didn't play well, and I was like a mess. And um, I texted him and I said, "I'm never doing this again." And he wrote back and he said, "That's fine." but you can change your mind too. And <laughs> I thought that was, it's like the perfect response. Like, yes, absolutely. You, you don't have to do this again. However, you can, if you want later, you can do this again, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I thought, yeah, he's, he's a very special person. <laughs> That's great. Cause you know, you, there's always a moment where you want to quit. Yeah. And then you, you can allow yourself to feel like that. And then you bounce back and not quit, yeah. you know? Those and I think those moments are, are important, you know, because yeah. then you, it, it, if and when you do keep going, it makes it all the more meaningful, you know? Exactly. Well, thank you, Susanna. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, so this has been such an enlightening episode. I really enjoyed interviewing you. So um, thank you so much. And if you're out there enjoying Crushing Classical, please write a review on iTunes and come and join the conversation at facebook.com slash crushing classical and instagram at crushing classical um and we have a facebook group called classical cats so please join it and that's where we continue the conversation after these interviews and um our other episodes like the fireside chats which come out every sunday so thanks for listening and we'll see you next time bye